and I'm from the University of South Denmark. I think we're going to leave it like this. The, what I'm, we have been working on in my master thesis is organization of uh, what we want to do is we have um, a tractor uh, and at the side here uh, in the gray area there's we want to remove the burning area. So for the tracks to be able to navigate down the road, so, uh, so uh, some of it, it has to know where it is compared to the trees. So I set up some demands for how I was expecting the tracks to move. I expected it to move from one road to the next and make a headland turn in the area outside. And I also expected that the distance between the trees would be somewhat the same. So it was a recognizable pattern and that the distance between the roads would also be the same. As you can see in the picture above, what was the most important is the weed area. Weed area we had, where we had to remove weeds and the trees and the support posts they are using to from when they come up from sequence. Also there's a water hose and the reason it's moved up is because we are using this uh, burning unit to uh, remove the weeds. So it has to it can be placed on the ground as normal what's a normal situation. Because the port was placed somewhat far away from this view, we had to come up with a, another solution to make some tests in the start. So I created a simulated orb where I only used the support codes to create the sign orb and log some data. You should notice that I've chosen to make one of the roads shorter and view one of the um, trees from, uh, from the orb to to make a more natural scenario because you can encounter rows that are different lengths and you can encounter the tree have died out for some reason. And you should still be able to localize, localize where you are inside the orb. So to look, uh, localize the tractor, I use three sensors. The clothes on the back wheels, <coughs> the SIG LMS 200 laser scanner, and, and the new, uh, where I use the rotation speeds that measures the tracks to make uh, the localization. To evaluate where I am inside the orb, I'm using a GPS. It's only used for evaluation because what I want to do is remove the GPS from the solution because it can drop out and it can be a very tough solution to use in this, in this uh, sense that you don't, it can't provide information about where the trees are and you could lock the lines where the trees are placed but they could change over time. So it's smarter, as I see it, to know where to get information about where the trees are right now. So I started up with making an analysis of the, the, the orchid and different things I could encounter. So what you see in the first row is basically the things I see as the important parts of the big orchid. And the external factors is in, in the next row that has influence on the sensors and what factors they are can measure. make the localization, I used extended calendar line, basically slam in this case, where I detect the trees and make a match to a map I have created. When I start, I have no trees in this map, so I start without knowing any, have no, have no information about my surroundings. And for each 
time I detect an entry, I add it to the map, combined with the new, new position I have. So, if we look at the laser scan that should uh, detect the trees, this is an example from the real orb. And you see there is some points. I know it's a very, very good example, but it, it will take too long to uh, show all the bad scenarios. But you can see the support pole and the tree beside each other. And right now I'm segmenting the, the, the scan up in parts that I find relevant. Okay, the next, um, I, uh, I saw it out and I only use this part because when I move inside the rows, I find this part the most relevant to look at. I want to look at the row just beside me. Okay, the next thing is to basically determine the row in, in these scans measurements. And to do this, I use Grandsight to detect the two lines on one on each side. As you saw in the, in the start, I made a simulated orchid where, uh, the, where, where one of the rows were, was shot and the other, so I can encounter a scenario where one of the rows are missing, but I should still be able to move on. To detect the individual trees, I'm using a Gauss function, a number of Gauss curves, where I match the, the line I've detected, where I think the row is, I match it onto the, 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 the laser scanner laser and find the most likely candidates that could be the trees. And thereby I can remove a lot of the noise you see in, in the scans and detect the trees because I know there's a pattern, there's a somewhat constant distance between the trees. The way I determine where to place this curve is by matching it down through the, the scan and finding the place where it provides the highest probability overall and then selecting for each curve the tree with the, uh, the scan point with the highest um, probability and using it as the tree. This result in a solution, as you see down here, you see that it's uh, wobbling sometimes, and the reason why you see this rock, uh, wobbling is because you, it sometimes selects the tree or sometimes selects the support. <coughs> if you look at the slam I've written, when I start, I make some initial, I have an initial phase where I just then still can get some data. And when it moves down, you should be able to see the hole that I had here before. That should don't arrive any trees in it. And it should continue on and knock all the trees down the road. <coughs> There's, as you saw just before, there was a, a few seconds where it didn't provide any data. You can encounter scenarios where the laser scanner hits the ground or encounters something, so it provides fake, bad data. And a big problem for Cameron Fitter is that if you give it fake, bad, bad data, it becomes, yeah, um, disturbed and, and can't continue so, so well. So I'm quite nursing it and throwing out all the bad data and only providing data where I'm 100% sure that it's working. So, as you see now, it's able to detect the trees and move down the rows. The ne next thing I have to work on was when I came from one row and was moving to the next row, I'm moving in a long period without having any laser days because I'm only detecting it inside the rows. So what I needed to do was to make up a matching scenario so I could match the new, newly detected trees to the ones I have just 
missing the ball from my, my slam up really. My solution to that was to say the, the tree that I had encountered last time as the last tree was also the most likely to be the one that I encounter next time. So I matched the tree up against each other and basically blocked it in the part from when I moved from one road to, to the next. Normally, when you make this matching, you use maximum likelihood. And, but in this scenario, I found that this solution would work better, but only when you are moving from in a, from up ahead or so. The result of this you should be able to see here. And it's basically all example rows I showed before. That's moving down the rows. And you can see that the trees are actually moving because it's a dynamically map that is updating over time. It makes the best estimate of where it is against the trees right now. Again, you can see that it doesn't update, put in a tree at the point where there's a tree that's missing. That would be something you could expect if there was a mistake in the cave. In the filter that I've been logging onto a bad tree or making a putting bad laser into it, then I, I would have a, a tree here after the turn. The main problem with using extended plumbing filtering where I just continue to map the trees is that I can't use it in real time because more trees slows the algorithm. So my solution to this was I only want to know where I am compared to the trees surrounding me right now. So I began to remove the old ones. I've found some articles about this solution, but what they normally do is they have a global and a local map. And they start at the local map, and when they have moved for some time, they try to put the, some of the landmarks over in the global map. And they move for maybe 10 seconds or something like that. And then they try to put them back again, but it's, they are very much successful in doing that. But I don't need all the old landmarks for rooms I'm not moving in right now. I only want to know where I am compared to trees right now. So what I'm providing is not global coordinates, but it's local coordinates for where I am compared to trees. It's a bit different than what you normally see. The reason why I have chosen to have 50 trees uh, that's rather large still is that I still want to evaluate my data against my GPS data and to do that I, I need to have something to match my rows up against the GPS estimated row cycle lot. You will see here in the next slide that one of the problems I had was I have a dynamically updating map and that's a, that was kind of hard to evaluate because it's kind of changing over time so I can't block the whole path and match it against the trees. So I have to map it at different stages and match it for, for the trees. The result of this was that I got sideways error. The error compared to trees of, yeah, the large was somewhere about a 0 0.23 centimeters. And in 81.4% of the cases, I got a value below one, 0 0.1. That was my goal for, for this project, to actually have all the measurements below at that point. But I didn't succeed completely in that. 
in the movement along the road, I strive to have a, a value that was below one to two percent of the the, the movement I've made, and that was the, the goal of my, my project. <coughs> the bad part that I've been thinking, the real bad part of this is that when I made a headline, sorry, I was expecting that just before that uh, I was walking up to the roads, I would have an error of 0 0.3 meters, but I actually encountered errors that was a lot larger. So that part, I need to work a little more to, to get it up more precise. And I think it's part of the, the way I make, I make the other three measurements, calculations. But still, it provides a good estimate. If we look back at this one, you can see that it actually are able to predict its position so, uh, somewhat good for a long period where it doesn't get any measurements and still are going to the rows when it comes back. Going to take some time, but <laughs> so the problem I'm encountering is basically in the turning. There's a connection between this row and this row I forgot. Is there anybody who can tell me what I've forgotten? <laughs> no, no, I know it is. It's, it's maybe a bit difficult, but what I forgot to do was the row I can tilt. And the way the laser scanner is placed is quite high above, so when I start, I assumed that the, the, uh, the positions I got from the laser scan, uh, from the GPS was co totally correct, but if I'm towing, I get a, an error in it, so if I have uh, accounted for that error, I could actually get a lot, probably get a lot better to solve from, uh, from my, my head measurements. But still, I haven't verified this, so it's only an assumption. And that was my last. Um, right now, it's only implemented in MATLAB, but the solution is intended to be implemented in the full my architecture. And what I'm working on is actually porting it quite simple from MATLAB because I've write and written the code, so it's actually able to be ported directly from MATLAB. Any questions? I noticed uh, that, that in one of the way you uh, simulate how it's driving uh, through the roads, it's not driving very much in the middle of the, of the roads. And that's actually the main purpose is to, uh, to be able to, to drive. You mean I'm driving in the middle? Yeah, especially when it's coming back later on in the row, it's, uh, it's very much to one side. Okay, right now <coughs> I'm only working on this localization. So I can see your point. <coughs> so right now I'm driving. So I know, you know you can see there is a, a gap right here when it, when it gets in, but that's basically when it, get, it goes from headline zone to in-road driving and it locks on. And that's
that's basically the problem right now, that the estimate of the headline zone is too bad. But also here you can see it's very much uh, swabbering around in between the trees. Yeah, but still it's, it's me driving. I, I try to not be totally straight down the lines. I, did, I didn't just evaluate this for, for one set, but, but for more sets. So I actually made it for four sets, so it's not just a last shot I made. If you don't correct the GPS, it could uh, reduce the height of the GPS. I know it gives problems uh, when you decrease the height of the GPS antenna, I mean, but uh, you could use the ground plate to, to avoid the reflection from the ground surface. So, but my, my question is, uh, uh, what happens if, if the trees are green? If the trees are green? You, you, you're, you're thinking on if there's leaves on it. Uh, on yes, the because you did the measurements during winter time, right? Okay, well, I could have shown that um, there's actually a, a problem, or this, I, I'm actually able to remove a lot of branches and a lot of stuff because I'm using the Gauss function you saw uh, before, because I'm looking at for a some, somewhat constant pattern, and branches and leaves should be moving and it should be spread out. I also looking, if you look at my segments, I don't, I don't think I explained that, but I'm looking for the ones that are large because they are more likely to be the trees. So I'm using a factor of both the Gauss functions but also a probability of how large they are and combine them to select the trees. And I, if I'm on some, for, for some period, I don't put them into the uh, common filter because it's giving the, the filter back. <coughs> what I also, what I, what I also tried to consider for was putting the laser scanner very low, so I would get the tree stem and maybe some weeds and the water hose. I, I didn't take an example of that, but, but I'm actually able to segment and, so, uh, and detect the, the water hose and throw it out because it's very, it's aligned in the, in, the, in the scan, so it's easily detectable. Any more? What, what is the purpose of what you're doing? Is that to, uh, to uh, create a map of all the trees? which can be used for another robot later on, or is the purpose to, to, uh, to do all this every time that a, a robot goes into the it, robot? It's, it's basically to do this every time, because the, the environment changes over time. Somebody could have, have put them right down the roads, and some, next time I'm going down, somebody could have moved two, uh, two trees from the, from the environment, and that wouldn't be optimal. So, this will be a solution for each time. It's a local map, it's a short, short range map, but it provides the ability to know where the roads are and so you can move from one road to the next. It don't have the ability to move from row one to row six because I don't have any information about row six. So if you wanted to move from row one to row six, you needed to move along the roads and localize them and and then turn into that road. Right now, I'm only providing laser scans from when I'm inside the roads. Well, well I, can, I can see it's, it's a challenge to do what, but from a, a practical point of view, I would guess that, uh, that it would be a great benefit for, uh, for the grower to have this automatic localization of the trees. And you could, uh, you could uh, be spared of much trouble because he could do it in winter time where there's no leaves on, on the trees and so on. Um, so, so for uh, yeah, but let, let's say if, if you are going for, for something which can be used on the short term uh, with, a, with, with a big probability of success, I would, I would restrict myself to the presentation of the trees. Can, can I ask, answer that one? <laughs> the, the idea is not to 
it's to have a robust system where you can go from one orchard to the other and you don't have the demand on the farmer that he needs a map of his orchard. Mm -hmm. We can do that, but this is for the navigation purpose, which is supposed to be more, be more robust than base your navigation on a map you think is correct. Because there's always a problem with your databases and the data quality. You don't know if the map is okay. But for all humans, we don't need a map of the whole orchard to navigate. We just need to know the structure, and then we can do the navigation. A short one, okay. Yeah. You also have to keep in mind that this is GPS-based navigation. So we would never actually have a true position knowledge for any time. So even though we had a map that was created during the time, we would have a lot of troubles trying to figure out where it actually is in that map. So it's, it's simply a GPS-less way of, of positioning yourself so that you can navigate ideally directly in the center of the river.